Well, good evening, Grace Church. Always thankful to be with you and to have an opportunity to open God's Word with you. Very thankful. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 3. Solomon's prayer for wisdom will be our focus for this evening. Wisdom. Where do you go for wisdom? Uh, You may rush your answer to that question and say, you know, wisdom, that's easy. I just ask Alexa. (laughs) Alexa answers all my questions and can play music and help me not burn the cookies. It's great. Maybe you're a fan of Siri. You just ask your phone everything. Old school. Maybe you prefer to to Google every question under the sun. Maybe with wisdom, you're excited about the advances in technology and you're just uh, thrilled to see artificial intelligence become a thing. AI and chat GPT. It's helping you with work and emails. You're feeling wiser all the time. Sermons brought to you by chat GPT. Uh, Just kidding, of course not. Alexa, Google, AI, those of course aren't real sources of wisdom. Those are only sources of information. Having access to information like that, sometimes it gives us a, a false confidence that we are actually wise. In some ways, giving the illusion of wisdom, but Having information, having access to that kind of information is not the same thing as having actual wisdom. It's not intelligence. Having information doesn't make you wise. Just because Google can return a search in under a second doesn't mean you're any better off in life. Wisdom, it's, it's having the experience or the knowledge to understand how things work and that experience, that knowledge, it produces in you good judgment. Wisdom comes knowledge and discernment. With wisdom, you can discern the best way to do something. With wisdom, you can arrive at solutions to problems much faster than others. With wisdom, you can avoid trouble and make life much easier for yourself. With wisdom, you can make life much easier for those around you. Wisdom can give you good judgment to discern truth from error. It can help you make the best decision when it doesn't really seem to be a clear answer or or solution in front of you. Wisdom can help you detect the true intentions of the people around you. For these reasons and more, wisdom is something that is so highly valuable. Something that all of us should want. A teenager should want wisdom more than popularity. A fresh college graduate should want wisdom more than that dream job. A newly married couple should want and desire wisdom more than financial security. Mom's greatest need, it isn't the never-ending battle against laundry to go away. Thank your mom, by the way, for the laundry she does. Mom needs wisdom. The need for wisdom, it's it's a need that we all have. A need that we, we share. Relationship status doesn't change that need. Age isn't a factor where you live, what your last name is. None of that eliminates your need for wisdom. If you're alive, you need wisdom. So let me ask again, where do you go for wisdom? Alexa can't get us there. AI arguably just making us dumber. But what about people, disciples, parents, teachers, maybe even a pastor, 
You'd go to them for wisdom. And of course, those people are so helpful. They're in our lives for a reason, to be a great help. And they're often older and wiser people. They usually have that life experience that you so desperately need. And they can speak into that question that you have. Or they have the spiritual maturity to help you think biblically about your issue, about your lack of wisdom. Generally, folks like that are pretty well equipped to help us in our moments of need. They're a good source of wisdom. But here's the thing. Even though those people are helpful, we realize that we're just borrowing from their wisdom. And and although that's great and, of course, necessary at times throughout our life, wouldn't you like to be wise on your own? Wouldn't you like to have that knowledge to understand enough about people and life to be discerning? Wouldn't you like to have your own wisdom to make that best decision no matter the situation you face? Wouldn't you like to have your own wisdom to have good judgment about what to do next when the way forward isn't exactly clear? Wouldn't you like to have wisdom of your own to know how to get through that trouble that you face It's not about being independent from good counsel, but you should want wisdom for yourself. A couple years ago, I went to speak at a camp and my wife Leah came with me and because um, I'm not wise, I forgot my phone charger. And because Leah, who is both wise and responsible, Uh, She, of course, had her phone charger with her. And and now for three, four days, I'm just borrowing her charger all the time. It's less than an ideal situation. Maybe you can relate to that, not to highlight our phone addictions, but to just recognize the dependence on others to get through the day. Imagine what that would be like every day. There's you with your phone and, and no charger, What would that look like? Always having to borrow someone else's, depending on everyone else around you to loan you that charger. That's a really rough way to have a phone. Well, depending on everyone else to loan you their wisdom, that's a tough way to get through life as well. You you need wisdom. You can't Google your way through life. You can't depend on everyone else around you to loan you their wisdom all the time. Main reason, too, is because God desires you to have wisdom of your own. Despite my argument, God desires you to have wisdom of your own. It shouldn't surprise you to know that God is the ultimate source of wisdom. That's, of course, why he is God. But it may surprise you to know that God doesn't just want to loan you his wisdom. He wants to give you wisdom. He wants you to have wisdom for you to possess, wisdom that's yours, wisdom that's for you to use. James chapter one, James is writing to believers who who are going through a really difficult time. Those Christians were really hurting and they had real trouble. And in those In his letter to those believers, James calls that sort of difficult life moment, he calls it a trial. And for those in trial, James writes this in verse five of James one, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. God is the source of wisdom and God wants us to know that he's also a God who wants to give us wisdom. You need it. God has it, and his desire is to give you wisdom. God offers us this great gift, but we can't can't miss this. It's implied that we need it because we don't naturally have wisdom. Um, Not trying to hurt your feelings tonight, but you are not born wise. You are not wise on your own. None of us are. When it comes to wisdom, we're, we're all lacking. We all are in need of wisdom, and here is God with infinite wisdom, 
offering us wisdom. He has wisdom for you, wisdom for your trial, wisdom for you to be more discerning. God has wisdom for you to make better decisions and and have better judgment. God has wisdom you need for life. And don't miss this. This wisdom, you need it. My hope is that our text tonight will convince you that this wisdom is something that you should want. If you want wisdom of your own, there's really only one place to go, and better, there's really only one whom we can go to, and that one is God. In middle school, I give the students a big idea. Our main idea for tonight is simple. God is the source and supplier of the wisdom that we need. God is the source and supplier of the wisdom we need. In other words, if you need wisdom tonight, and I can't imagine there's anyone here thinking they don't, if, if you want wisdom, if you wanna grow in wisdom and discernment, then you need to learn to ask God for wisdom. James isn't the first person to write of God being the, the giver of wisdom. This truth is on display in 1 Kings chapter three. 1 Kings three, a, a great reminder that we need wisdom and that we should ask for wisdom and that God is faithful and able to give wisdom to those who ask the right way. Let's read it together, 1 Kings 3, and we'll start in verse one. God's word says, Then Solomon formed a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter, and brought her to the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people were still sacrificing on the high places because there was no house built for the name of the Lord until those days. Now Solomon loved the Lord, walking in his statutes of his father David, except he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. King went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask what you wish me to give you. Solomon said, You have shown great loving kindness to your servant David, my father, according as he walked before you in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart toward you. And you've reserved for him this great loving kindness that you've given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you've made your servant king in place of my father David, yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Your servant is in the midst of your people which you've chosen. A great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil, for who's able to judge this great people of yours? Verse 10, it was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God said to him, because you've asked this thing and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Behold, I've done according to your words. Behold, I've given you a wise and discerning heart so that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. I've also given you what you've not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will, be, there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. If you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and commandments as your father David walked, then I will prolong your days. If any of you were reading numerous 1 Kings commentaries, you might have some questions about these opening verses concerning Solomon, this marriage, Pharaoh's daughter, and mention of these high places. Is this a a sign of the 
downfall of Solomon. Didn't God forbid such a thing? Exodus 34 and Deuteronomy 7 and those high places again mentioned in verse 2 and 3. Isn't that a, a term for a place of idol worship by the pagan nations around Israel? That's how it's so often used in the Old Testament. We read in Psalm 78, verse 58, for they, Israel, provoked him, God, to anger with their high places. They moved him to jealousy with their idols. Although it's, it's not a popular opinion, uh, I, I'm not sure that this is the author's way of, of highlighting the beginning of Solomon's sinister ways. Verse three is, is also a very positive statement about Solomon. You see that. It says he loves the Lord. Solomon loved Yahweh. Pretty sure that's the only place in the Old Testament where it says that a man loved God. David, Solomon's father, was a man after God's own heart, but only here do we get this comment. Solomon loved the Lord. Walking in the statutes of David, his father. Now, this walking in the ways of David, his father, that's another indication from the author of the kind of king Solomon was. In the, uh, the books of the kings, after the, the kingdom splits into two, Jeroboam becomes king in Israel, which is in the north, and Rehoboam becomes king of Judah in the south. But geography isn't the point. Jeroboam, the first, this servant of Solomon who became king of of Israel, he was the worst of kings. In, in chapter 12, we would read of Jeroboam how he basically just invents this new religion, a false religion that would plague the people of God for the rest of her days. And as we turn the clock forward, we read how the kings which followed in these two kingdoms how most of them are compared either to David or to Jeroboam. Positive for David and negative for Jeroboam. Chapter 15, for example, verse 11, King Asa says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as David, his father, had done. Same chapter, verse 34, we get a negative example. This King Baasha, it says, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and he walked in the way of Jeroboam. So back to chapter three, for Solomon to be compared to his father, David, this is a good thing. This is a positive remark by the author. He loves God. He, he obeys God's ways as he was instructed by his father, which I believe is why verse five, God appears to Solomon at this high place in Gibeon in this dream. This is why God has, has come to Solomon, a positive picture of our new king and, and why God is offering him this once in a lifetime opportunity. We know Solomon isn't perfect. He's doing mostly right in the eyes of God. He, he loves to worship God and please God. He's earned the respect of Egypt and their leaders. Pharaoh is willing to give him his daughter. A, a nation that once ruled over them is now seeking to align with them. Regardless of how much we may want to see this chapter as kind of hinting at the, the cracks in the armor of Solomon. The point is clear. This chapter is not about that. Those chapters are after, but this chapter, it's about wisdom. It's about asking, asking for a wise mind and asking for a, a discerning heart. The theme is, is, is clear. God asks Solomon, what do you want? Verse five, he says, ask what I should give you. Ask for what you want. A great question and one that we need to ask ourselves daily. God gives Solomon this amazing invitation, an, an amazing opportunity that I think all of us would, you know, would dream of. This is a, a true Aladdin moment, but it's, it's so much better. There is Solomon standing before not a genie, but, but God. 
And God is offering this, verse five, ask what you wish me to give you. What do you want from me? Here is our unchanging God, the God that we've read about in James who offers wisdom for those in need. Here is the same God offering to give whatever is desired. And as Solomon asks for wisdom, we can learn so much about it. As we think about asking God for the wisdom that we need for life, there are some questions for us to ask that will help us learn so much more about it. And the first question we might ask is this, why should we ask for wisdom? Why should we ask for wisdom? And the answer is this, number one, God's ready to give wisdom. God's ready to give wisdom. Verse five, ask what shall I give you? God's ready and equipped to give to those who ask. He isn't saying, hey, ask, and then, you know, I'll, I'll think about it. God's saying, ask, because I'm the giving God. I'm the God who's ready to give, the God who's wanting to give. We might return to James chapter four, verse two, where we read, you do not have because you do not ask. God's ready to give. God doesn't restrict his offer for wisdom. Wisdom's not reserved for the elite. God doesn't show partiality with his giving. Wisdom isn't exclusively for those who serve as kings. No, how God loves those who are his, how God longs to give and give good things like wisdom, this good gift that we desperately need. God loves to give and he's generous in his giving. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 11, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask him? What do you want? Why should you ask for wisdom? Because God is ready to give you wisdom. That's, that's why we should ask. In verse 6 Solomon's answer to God's gracious offer answers the second question, which is how should we ask for wisdom? How should we ask for wisdom? A second question, and I would answer it this way, ask for wisdom with confidence. Ask for wisdom with confidence. God's faithfulness is on display in these next few verses and his faithfulness should lead us to ask for wisdom with an attitude of confidence. Verse six, Solomon recounts this covenant faithfulness that God had shown his father and how faithfulness is on display. Solomon's reminded of it every time he looks in the mirror and he now sits on the throne, an obvious reminder of, of God's faithfulness. It's interesting, Solomon doesn't begin to answer that question like we should or like we would or Maybe that's just my imagination. I, I think we'd start listing off. If God were to ask, you know, what do you want? We're just gonna start listing things off, trying to narrow down this list, to trying to find some answer to that question, you know, furiously trying to say it in our heads. The kids' college tuition is coming up. I mean, maybe some of them will get a scholarship. The mortgage, I don't know, a couple years left on that. Maybe I should ask to lose a few pounds. I mean, it could just seem selfish. Maybe I just stop eating like a horse. What about our parents' health? I could wish for that or our kids to choose good spouses. Maybe I just ask for money. I think we would have a conversation with ourselves like that if we were in Solomon's shoes, but that's not what he does. We get a little sneak peek at maybe what Solomon was tempted to ask for in verse 11, riches, long life, or, or short life for his enemies. He might be tempted to ask God for similar things, but Solomon doesn't need to start narrowing down his list. That's not what he does. He simply rehearses the past, and it's, it's God's faithfulness in the past that has his attention. God has been so faithful to the promises that he made his father. And then further back in history, verse 8, Solomon is, is highlighting the, 
God's faithfulness to his promises made to Abraham, the, the Abrahamic covenant, that phrase, too many to number or to be counted. It's meant to remind us of that. Genesis 13 and Abrahamic covenant that God made there, God's faithful. He, he promised Abraham that he'd make his offspring as the dust of the earth. It says in Genesis 13, 16, if you, one could count the dust of the earth, your offspring could be counted as well. So Solomon's alluding to that history. It's, it's, not, it's not forgotten on him. He recalls the past and, and he uses it to remind himself of, of God's faithfulness. He sees it crystal clear when he looks back God has done it. God's faithfulness, it's unmistakable. God's faithfulness, it's, it, it leads Solomon to be confident to ask God for wisdom. And knowing how good God has been in the past, how faithful God has been to give and to make good on his promises, Solomon then confidently asks for what he is sure God will give. Bill Ralph Davis says it this way, we realize as we rehearse Yahweh's record that we are coming to a faithful God. Praising God for what he has done, then it becomes the basis of our confidence. Solomon knows that God is dependable. He knows that God is reliable. He's reminded every day as he sits on the throne. And if God is offering, then God, because of who he is, is not only ready to give, but he is able to give. God's record is perfect. He's yet to miss. He's never let us down. He's never broken his word. He can give you the wisdom that you need. From the Garden of Eden to Golgotha, where Christ was crucified, God made promises and he's kept them. From the early church up until this very day, God has made promises and he's kept them. The promises that are yet to be fulfilled, we can be sure they will be one day. Why? Because God is faithful. God is faithful. God is yet to let us down. And so when you ask God for wisdom, you ask with the same attitude. You, you ask someone with a perfect record, God is faithful. And so you ask confidently. Verse seven to eight, it reveals sort of the motive here for Solomon's request. He stands there knowing he has one opportunity to, to answer and it appears Solomon's motives are a little different. He knows he's young, calling himself a little child in verse seven. It's less about age. It's more about experience or rather a lack of experience. Solomon recognizes his limitations like a, a little child. He's inexperienced. He knows he needs help to be the kind of king that God's people need. He, he lacks the wisdom to lead God's people the, the way that he should. Not knowing how to go out or come in. It sounds like a little kid thing to say, right? But it's so often used in, in scripture to describe military leadership that's lacking, it's how Moses talked about his own inability to lead in, in Deuteronomy 31 too. He says, I can no longer go out or come in. So Solomon's prayer here then is, it's one that admits he doesn't know how to lead and God's people are too important for him to mess this up. It's a big task. Probably felt pretty overwhelmed. And so what does Solomon do? He asks for wisdom. Solomon could do it, not because he was confident in his own ability or his brain to, to figure this thing out or to follow just the example of his father. No, he could do it. He could be the kind of king God's people deserved only if God would help him. So he asks with confidence. This is the kind of wisdom Solomon requests, and it's our third question to ask about wisdom, we've answered the question, why ask for wisdom and how to ask for wisdom. So let's ask a third question. What kind of wisdom should we ask God for? And the answer is wisdom that's ultimately helpful for God's people. What kind of wisdom should we ask God for? 
wisdom that's ultimately helpful for God's people. Solomon asks in verse nine for a hearing heart. He, he asks for discernment, he, for, for wisdom. Solomon's request, it may seem kind of personally beneficial at first, but notice his motive. It's not for himself. Solomon's motive is for God's people. It's the people of God that are, that are his chief concern and could learn from Solomon to ask for wisdom like that. Yes, ask wisdom for ourselves, but for wisdom that will be most helpful to the people around us, for others, especially God's people. We want wisdom to help us interact with with others, especially believers. We want to do that the way that best suits God's purposes, God's plans. We need wisdom for that. For Solomon, that includes wisdom to instruct God's people, to to lead them, to aid God's people, ultimately in, in fearing God. Solomon's perhaps most famous for his Proverbs, so grateful for them. And, and Proverbs chapter one, verse seven, perhaps his most famous saying, fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The author has already told us Solomon is a man who, who loves the Lord. He fears God. He, he walks in his ways and he wants to know God better. He, he wants to love him more, to be wiser. Why? So that he can lead God's people to do the same. He can lead God's people to do the very same thing. He wants to lead in the the best way possible. He wants Israel to, to fear the Lord as he does. He wants to be a blessing to them and a joy for them. So Solomon asks for an understanding mind, a hearing heart, a listening heart, a heart that doesn't just hear God's truth, but listens to it. He wants a heart that obeys. And heart is a word that's more than just heart or or mind. It's more than just emotions. It's the whole person. That's what he's saying. For Solomon, it's now the way he thinks, the words he'll use, the actions he'll commit. It's his affections. It's, It's his will, all of him. He wants every part of his life to live wisely to know God and obey God so that he can lead and care for God's people the way that they deserve to be led. Solomon's not concerned about his fame or his glory, not here. Solomon's prayer is directed by the need of God's people and their need for strong and discerning leadership. He's concerned about being a king that profits and benefits those around him, that's the kind of wisdom that we should pray for. That's the kind of wisdom that we need. And even though you aren't a king called to lead God's people, it's still the wisdom we should ask for. Listen, the kind of wisdom you need to be a better husband and father, the kind of wisdom you need to be a better wife and mother, to be a better employee or a better student, the kind of wisdom you need to be a better Christian, it's the same kind of wisdom Solomon asked for. You want wisdom that most benefits and profits God's people around you. Wisdom that cares for them, that that blesses them. Wisdom that's a joy in their life. A listening heart. A life that in all aspects seeks to hear and obey the very word of God. That's the wisdom we should pray for. That's the kind of wisdom we need, the kind that we should all want. So when it comes to wisdom, God is ready to give it. That's why we should be asking for it daily. His his faithfulness, it gives us confidence to ask for it. That's how we should ask. And wisdom that profits and benefits the people of God, that's the kind of wisdom we should want. And when we pray for this kind of wisdom, here's the result in verse 10. God was pleased with Solomon's request. Fourth question for us. What's the goal of asking for wisdom? What's the, what's the result of asking for wisdom? Well, the answer is asking for wisdom pleases God. 
asking for wisdom, it pleases God. God was so pleased, in fact, that it tells us God expresses his pleasure to give Solomon what he asked for and also for what he didn't ask for, but could have. It pleased the Lord that Solomon asked for wisdom. Solomon's request, it it put a smile on God's face like the way a a mother might smile should one of her kids ask to clean up after dinner or the way a dad might react getting into his teen's car and noticing it clean and full gas tank. I've never experienced either of those, but I do think it would put a smile on my face if that were to happen. Just like Solomon's request, it, it pleased God. Like a proud father of his child, God was so delighted in Solomon's request. And our request for wisdom, it should be one that has the same goal in mind. We should ask that it would please God that we've asked him. I know it's what my my father wants me to ask for. I, I, I should do that, knowing that it would please him. Yet that's not what's common during a trial for Most of us, our immediate reaction is to take matters into our own hands. When trial hits or we face trouble or some predicament, some difficulty, we're so quick to try to think of all the ways to fix it. It's gonna be okay. We we have our savings account. We'll be fine. This is gonna be okay. I can... You know, call that friend from church who's a doctor. We'll, we'll be fine. I can call my sister. Or you can call your dad. They'll know what to do. It's okay. We'll be fine. I can find another job. I can call my old boss. I can fix it. We can fix this. We'll be just fine. Some version of that is likely our responses in the face of trial and when trouble hits, but Problem is none of those please God. None of those please God. Instead, what would please our Father would be for us to go to him first, to ask for wisdom for this situation and not because we have nowhere else to turn, but because it's our practice to do so. I have no idea what to do is a totally okay response to a trial especially when we follow it. Let's go to the one who does know what to do. Let's ask for wisdom. Let's ask for discernment for what to do next. Let's let's ask for God's help, knowing we're only going to get through this with his help anyway. That's the result of a of a regular practice of asking God for wisdom. It's our first instinct. It's our knee-jerk reaction. Let's go to the source of wisdom, and it's that request that pleases God. One last question, and I think God knows us well. He knows we're slow to learn. So let's return to that first question. Why else should we ask for wisdom? And the answer is this. God is a generous giver. Why else should we ask for wisdom? Because God is a generous giver. Not only is he ready to give, he's also a generous giver. Verse 11 helps us see this situation a little clearer again. These are likely the things that Solomon almost asked for but didn't. And we see that because he asked for the best thing, because he asked for wisdom, God was generous to give him that. He wasn't just given a pinch of wisdom. No, verse 12, he was given wisdom and discernment, it says, in amounts that put him in a category all by himself. No one like him, not before him, not after him. A generous amount of wisdom. And verse 13, God also gave Solomon what he didn't ask for, riches and honor. And to the degree, again, putting him in a category all by himself. Solomon far exceeds all others. He's given wisdom by God. God gave in in abundance, and we shouldn't be surprised. We should ask for wisdom, knowing that God is generous in his giving. 
I don't intend to say that God will give you riches and glory if you ask him for wisdom. But I do agree with Paul who says in Ephesians 3.20, God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. God is gracious in his giving. He's generous in his giving and with wisdom. Can we also not expect that God might do in our lives something far above all that we might ask or even think possible? Can you not even now, for some of you who've only been saved for a short time, can you not see the goodness and abundance of kindness from God on display in your life? For those of you who've been saved for many years, do you not look back with just absolute amazement? God's been so good, so abundant in his kindness and blessing. He is a gracious giver. God is so generous to us, so much so that it's, it's kind of crazy to think that we rarely, if ever, ask for wisdom. It's so foolish on our end to delay asking for wisdom. It's, it's prideful even to think that we don't need the wisdom that God offers on a daily basis. What do you want? I hope the answer is wisdom. To the one who seeks wisdom, we ask from the God who's ready to give, ask with confidence, ask for wisdom for more than yourself, ask knowing that it pleases God and ask knowing that he's generous in his giving. When you ask for wisdom like that and you ask for wisdom from the God who's able to do far more than you can imagine, you can expect that his wisdom will yield benefits in our life that we never even thought possible. Solomon's prayer, it gives us a window here. This is the how and the why to ask for wisdom. And the rest of the chapter, it's just a reminder that God does what he said he would do versus 15 to 28, you know this story, these two moms and they come to Solomon because one of them is, is lying. They both have children and, and one of them accidentally kills their baby in the middle of the night and takes the other mom's child. It's a tough case. There's no witnesses, no one but Solomon to help. In verse 23, Solomon sort of sums up what he's heard and he's ready to give his judgment. Only a real mother's Love would rather her child be alive and with the wrong mother than dead. And so Solomon requests to split that baby into two. Give both moms half. And that, of course, reveals the true mother. Solomon's wisdom, it's, it's on display and word travels quickly. And I want you to see verse 28. It says it all. When, when all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had handed down, they feared the king for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. Israel heard the judgment of their king and they saw the wisdom of God was in him. Verse 28, it's a, it's a perfect match for what Solomon asks for in verse 9. It aligns perfectly. He wanted a life full of wisdom and to judge God's people and to have discernment between good and evil. And God had unmistakably and clearly granted Solomon's request. Why do we ask God for wisdom? Don't miss verse 28's conclusion. It's not Solomon's wisdom on display, but the wisdom of God that captivated all of Israel. And that should be our desire too, right? That we might get to bless others with the wisdom that, that God has given us, that the, the takeaway from others that we interact with would be similar, that people would be captivated with our God and his wisdom and his word at work in our lives. It's, it should be, right? Is it not our desire that our friends and our family and our neighbors would see God working in us like that? I hope so. Hope this wisdom from God is truly what you want. As we close, I can't help but think of one important connection. One connection between wisdom and the Lord Jesus. With David, we have a man after God's own heart. And now with his son Solomon, we have a man who loved the Lord. He loved God. And with both of them, we get to see glimpses of the kind of king that God intended for his people. 
For parts of his life, David was kind and he was loving and righteous and he's a great example of that loving kindness of God. And here's Solomon, he's, he's full of wisdom and discernment and his, his judgment appears impeccable. And as both fail to be the perfect king, both equally point to the king of kings who was to come, King Jesus. Jesus loved to do the will of his father far greater than David. John 6, 38, he says, I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And, and King Jesus embodied truth and wisdom far greater than Solomon. John 1, 14, he was full of grace, full of truth. 1 Corinthians 1, 24, Jesus is the wisdom of God, Paul writes. Our superior to David and Solomon, we have King Jesus. It's his wisdom we need and better, it's him that we need. Paul writes in Colossians 2, 3, it's Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom, all the treasures of knowledge. First Kings 3 gives us a sampling of the wisdom Jesus would have. Solomon is impressive, but he's not perfect. He was given wisdom, but friends, Jesus is wisdom. Solomon's wisdom and discernment, they point to the one who would far surpass him and eclipse him because in Jesus are all the treasures of wisdom and all the treasures of knowledge. King Jesus offers you himself he offers you his wisdom. He calls you to turn from your sin and to believe in his gospel and to follow him instead of you. And he wants you to, to trust him, to trust his perfect wisdom and commit to make it your practice to ask him for his wisdom as he guides your life precisely where it needs to be. What do you want? I pray you want wisdom. But more, I pray that you see that that wisdom is found in Christ. Father, thank you for your word. We are so grateful for this reminder in 1 Kings chapter three, Lord. Thank you for, for being the, the God who is ready and gracious to give us what we so desperately need. Father, would you help us to be more convinced that we need your son? We need the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom. Help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. Father, give us a desire to want the right things, to want wisdom from you and to live in a way where your work in our lives would be evident to those around us, that it would lead others to you. Father, I pray for our church. Help us to live in wisdom this week. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let me dismiss you with this, Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen.